Well, good morning. It is the 27th, I think, Power Hour. Wow. Been a lot of these with you guys. So uh, we're looking forward to, uh, to giving you some more good content here today. It is a bone chilling 74 degrees here in Miami Beach. And uh, I do have the mascot uh, available today, just so you know. That's Garfield. <laughs> so everybody, a lot of people want to see Garfield. He likes anything that moves. So that's, uh, that's pretty good. I'm doing it from my house today. Uh, sometimes we do it from the office, sometimes we do it live from a CFI class, but we are here. And what we're going to talk about today, uh, the fun part, is uh, how to become a flight instructor, how to become a career flight instructor, and make over 100 Gs a year. That's the, that's the job. So I think a lot of you are quite interested in, in that. Uh, also, at the end of the show, we'll go over uh, the next two power hours, what we usually do, and then some housekeeping stuff that we always go through. Uh, we'll direct you uh, uh, through that as we go. So anyway, I'll uh, begin here. Uh, say hi to the new people. Hi hello. <laughs> like I say, we've done 27, about 30 weeks. I guess there were a few holidays that are in the way. Uh, we've grown our list from about 18 when we first started to, now today you're 64, but uh, depending on the topic. Sometimes if it's a generic topic, like uh, we went through uh, the refresher on the sectional chart and some interesting fun things and that we had a lot of people for that. And we did, uh, of all things, Lazy Eights and Chandels last week. And uh, that was uh, attended uh, by the most people. It's over 100. Then we crashed the, not quite crashed Zoom, but Zoom cut us off at 100. So we've upgraded that to 500. And we're going to work on getting the list bigger and bigger as we, as we go through. So hopefully, uh, the format is pretty easy. The format is, uh, we're going to have some really interesting uh, topics, all single subject usually. Uh, not, yeah, all single subject. Usually that was kind of fun to say, all single subject. <laughs> and uh, then I hope to, that we're able to give you really, really good content. Uh, now, I can't answer every question, of course, because there's 100 people or nearly that will be. But uh, if you have something uh, that you need uh, or you need to say something, do it in the chat window down below and Nick and I will save the chat window. And if it's something that you, you need or whatever it is, we can, we can help you with that. If it's a comment saying hello, that's totally fine. Do whatever whatever you want. That's what it's for in the chat box there. So uh, what I'm going to do now is bring this, uh, make sure the share is uh, over in the right place, which it is. And this is the outline. And always uh, we'll provide you with, uh, with the outline. And the outline has sometimes some clickable links in it if there are resources to it. Uh, it you'll get this all the time. You also, because you're in the list for the power hours, you also will get uh, reminders for each of the shows as you probably already got this week. So uh, that's what, what's there. Okay, so let's talk about then this idea of becoming a career flight instructor and make, making uh, 100 Gs a year. And I say it's not that hard because I've done it for as long as I can remember. Uh, so, and, and I've uh, taught other people how to do it and I've uh, seen other people uh, do it and do it even better, right? And, and to that, uh, I'm gonna, not, we don't have him here on the show, but I do, I'm going to show you what uh, my man Gary Reeves looks like. He was a uh, flight instructor of the year uh, a couple years ago. He's, uh, he's from Texas. He, uh, he calls himself GPS. That's the guy in the pink shirt. <laughs> so he always wears a pink shirt. He uh, owns a company called uh, pilotsafety.org. We're not affiliated, but uh, we, are, we know each other really well. And uh, so he's a really good person. He's managed to carve out a $250,000 a year job as a career flight instructor. And I'll tell you how he did it too. He did not uh, learn from me. So, but he used the same principles. And I think those kind of things are, uh, are, are what we want to go through today. So this is uh, the beginning of the show then is this is the road to 100K. This is how we're going to get there. Uh, so I, I want to start off with uh, this question. And the question is, I think you have to answer, are you a teacher? Or are you a pilot who has to be a teacher? Because this is, uh, this is, this is something here. And I'll, I'll give you some background uh, on it in a minute and see why this question becomes fundamental to what uh, you need to, to ask yourself. So a flight instructor is an educator. Now, most of you don't want to hear that, or maybe, maybe you do. But uh, I think you think, uh, but in the beginning, anything can be fun. Almost anything you do can be fun. I flew a citation for a number of years and I couldn't wait to fly the citation. After a while, it was just a job, right? But at the beginning, it, was, uh, it wasn't a bad job, but it was, it was super fun. And then over some period of time, uh, what you are reveals itself to you. If you're a real teacher or you're a, 
a pilot or you're a, whatever it is, you, you'll, you'll know, right? If you dabble at something long enough, it'll either become something you truly love or it'll be something that, you know, you do. Uh, so that's where we are with that. So what I want to know is uh, ask yourself, are you a teacher or are you someone or you're a pilot who just happens to have to be a teacher because you need something else to be enabled for later on? And there's not, nothing inherently wrong with answering that either way. But I'm going to tell you that if you want to be in this business and you want to be a career flight instructor, you're going to need to be a teacher at some point. Uh, you can't just be a pilot. So the next thing is what motivates you to be a flight instructor is what I'd want to ask you next. And uh, so sometimes it would be something like, uh, well, it lets me, you know, stay current. It lets me basically not have a big bill at the end of the flight, which is a very, very good thing, right? Someone else gets the bill. Uh, that's what, uh, by the way, my friend Gary Reeves there, who I was telling you about, guy in a pink shirt, uh, he would uh, take people, we would be at AOPA, uh, all the AOPA shows. And we would be exhibiting and he would be there. And so after a period of time, you kind of, if you see your people's faces long enough in places where you got to pay money to be, you go like, oh, you might be serious about this after all. And that's why we were at all these conferences together. And you go like, oh, I see you're one of the serious ones in this business, right? Okay. And so he did, he, so he'd bring people because he doesn't do flight instructor training. So he would bring people up to the booth and, and this guy would, uh, he brought one guy once and the guy says, uh, I think I want to do this flight instructor thing. And so he says, but I'm, I'm not exactly sure if I, you know, I'm not positive if I want to do it, but I'm thinking about doing it. And Gary Reeves in his own funny Texas way, he says, look, he says, let me tell you your best day in aviation. He's what he talks like that. Let me tell you your best day in aviation. And they, the guy says like, what is it? He says, he says, it's the day, he says, when you land off your first flight with a student, he says, and then they go in and they pay the bill. He says, and then they pay you. He said, he said, that's like crack cocaine. He says, you can't get enough of that. <laughs> so that's uh, like crack cocaine. So what motivates you to be an instructor? Is it the teaching side of it? Is it the idea that you can, uh, maybe you have a lot of life experience and, and you want to sort of be able to share that with, uh, with people. Maybe you just like people. Maybe you, maybe you, maybe it's just to, to put an extra hour in your logbook. I don't know, but I think you have to know what motivates you. And so we're sort of carving out, okay, you know, who is, who am I? Are you able to move? Because you're probably going to need to. Uh, if you're in aviation and you want to be in aviation as a career, you're going to probably, you like that, you like that, you're going to, that's a must, and then probably like Yogi Berra, if there's a fork in the road, take it, you know, that's me. Right? So, uh, so anyway, uh, are you able to move? Because in this business, you move. Now, there'll be a point maybe where you don't have to move, or maybe you don't have to right now, but if you're doing it as a career as an airline pilot, you are going to move or you're going to be commuting. And then uh, there, we can talk all day about that, about what that's like as well at, at some future time. But in order to make some good cash, there's uh, some, uh, some things you're going to have to, to do. And one of them is you're going to be a, need to be around places that have an adequate supply of students, right? And uh, who can afford to pay the bill, right? And that comes in various flavors. And if you think about where these places are, uh, I'm, in, I'm in one of them right now, right? I'm in Miami, right? In San Francisco Bay Area is another, another place. And there are pockets of, uh, of training centers for aviation around the world, around the world, around the country that uh, you may have to be at for a while or maybe forever. Uh, but we'll, we'll talk about that. Are you able to? So the next question, because then this helps constrain, you know, where you're going to be looking uh, to be able to grow your business or grow things in such a way that you can make this money we're talking about. Uh, the next question I wanted to ask you, are you personable? Uh, so that means that are you, are you kind of a people person? Are you an introvert? Are you an extrovert? You know, I'm not, a, uh, I'm not an introvert, right? <laughs> I think all of you know that by now, right? I'm kind of an extrovert, but, uh, but that helps because I like people uh, generally. It's like a when I go to work, I, we have an office at WeWork, which is here in Miami Beach, and it's a shared space. And I, I don't sit in the office. And Nick sits in the office. And Jonathan, he'll sit in the office. And, but I, I go in the common areas. And the reason I'm out there is I, I'm in the middle of doing something like generating yet another uh, book for aviation. And, and then, I, then I get distracted by people that I like to be around, like John, who runs City Carts. He's a French guy. He's funny. He's, and he, uh, he runs City Carts, a golf cart rental business. And uh, a year or two ago, he was down in his luck and looked like who knows what was going to happen. And 
living in an apartment that's terrible with his wife. And now all of a sudden, you know, things started going well. And now he's driving a Porsche Cayenne and he's got a bunch of golf carts out there. And, but he's, he's a person to talk to. He bounce ideas on. So I love that kind of thing. So are you, a, are you personable? Are you pleasant to be around? Uh, yesterday, or two days ago, two days ago, one of our, our uh, uh, there's a flight school next to us, I, or another in the area, let's say. And uh, I know the flight instructor, one of the flight instructors there. And uh, the student shows up and uh, he shows up early for the class. And then uh, the flight instructor says, uh, says, how do I tell the student uh, that he smells, he stinks? And I'm like, yeah, people person, right? So I'm a people person. I said, just tell them. <laughs> like I don't say quite bad, but you know, you know, in a gentle way, you know, you, and so, you know, you have, are you able to, do, are you able to approach that? Right. Is that something, and if you're just a pilot, if you're not just, if you're a pilot, one of the things that, that you'll do is fly an airplane. Right. And sometimes it can be as simple as walk down the jetway or whatever it is, close the door behind you. You don't have to talk to anybody who's in the cockpit with you and make an announcement every now and then. Right. But in this business, you're going to know people. And, uh, and, and, re- and sometimes you learn more about them than you'd ever want to know, right? Uh, but uh, you have to, so you have to have this uh, sense of, of being a people person. Now there's a way around that. I'm gonna give you the secret for that in a second. Uh, but the idea is if you work at a part 61 school, so let's say there's 61 non-approved schools, there's part 141 schools. If you work at a part 141 school, uh, you don't have to be a people person necessarily because what's going to happen is if you get hired there, then all of a sudden there's going to be six students given to you. You don't know who they are ahead of time. They didn't know who you were going to be ahead of time. It was like, okay, you, you're flying with this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one. Get them done in six weeks or two months for private. And uh, whoever that entails, that entails. And if you're not the most people person in the world, you didn't have to sell yourself to that person at all. They were just handed to you because that's how the factory runs in a 141 school. And so uh, that's a recommend, but a recommendation to get started, right? Uh, the, so what I will tell you, the first thing, once you've answered your questions, sort of have your list of, uh, number one, are you a teacher? Your pilot has to be a teacher. What motivates you? Are you able to move and are you personal? Uh, once past there, we get to the point of accelerating the road. So I'm saying, how do we get to this 100 grand spot? You don't just get it overnight, but you can accelerate the time. And so what you need to do is you need to build your base hours and get mentored right away. So as a, as a, uh, as a new, new CFI, uh, depending on where you did your training and how much experience and time you have, chances are you have a relatively low amount of time, somewhere around 300 hours, and, uh, which seems like high because it took a long time to get there, right? And a lot of pain and agony and anguish went into that, I know. Uh, but uh, the things you could not buy. So you could, you could, uh, you could be like Pat Chumley. I want to tell you about Pat Chumley. Uh, if he, he's not here, but so I can talk about him. Right? No, he's a really good guy. So listen to this and see if this even is even possible in your mind, mind's eye, right? When you think about this. Pat Chumley called me and says, I want to do your CFI program. I'm very unhappy at the place I am. Okay, so we get that a lot, right? And I go, okay, and I know where he's at, which I won't say. <clears throat> and so then uh, we begin talking. He's from Texas. He's about 56. He had, he's married, has two kids, and uh, he lives in, in Texas, uh, in uh, Fort Worth area. And uh, he said, oh, I got this thing. I, just, I retired from my business. I, my wife now runs it. It's a construction company. And he said, I wanted to start flying. I want to be a flight instructor because I want to teach the kids and other people how to fly. I think it'd be something good to do. He says, so I uh, said, I started flying. I, bought, I just bought an airplane. I bought a Comanche. And I said, really, you bought a command? Yeah, you bought a command sheet. And he says, and then I didn't know anything about flying. So I, I took it to the mechanic and said, I, need, I think I need an oil change. <laughs> and he says, $10,000 later, they showed me all the stuff that I, I should have fixed. I'm like, okay, here's, here's something. I said, well, when did you start flying? And he said, I started April Fool's Day, April 1st. And I'm like, okay, uh, April 1st of what year? He said, this year, that was last year. And I said, well, this is August. This is not even August yet. April, May, June. And by the time August the 20th came along, uh, Pat Chumley had finished his private instrument commercial with 300 hours, his CFI and CFII, all by the time from April until the end of August of the same year, okay? He said me and my wife would go flying like six hours uh, just for dinner. We'd go to Kansas City, go all kinds of places, 
do whatever to build this time. I'm like, holy crap, you are a machine. And he could ingest all this stuff. And he had a big old beard, like it looked like ZZ Top beard. He got legs, you know, something like that, you know, jeez. And so it was like that. And I'm like, who is this, this crazy, but wonderful person after I got to know him, right? And uh, so he did, he went to this other place and said, I'm just going to do all your stuff too. And he did it and he finished and he passed every one of these tests on the first time. It was, it was incredible to see, but what could he not buy? What could he not buy? He could not buy experience, see? He could buy the training and he could do it in a very quick amount of time, but he, what he could not buy was experience. He had not even flown one season yet. He didn't fly in the wintertime yet, right? In Texas or wherever he was gonna fly from. Uh, he, uh, but he did have life experience. So meaning that one thing that he did have, he could manage conflict because there was some of it, quite a bit of it in his life because he ran a construction company and all this stuff. And so he, he was able to use some of that, right? But he couldn't buy the experience. So this is what you've got to get. And if you're a one man show uh, and you show up at some flight school that hires you as a flight instructor, you don't know enough yet. I mean, you know enough to function, but you don't have a lot of experience. So when you get in and around a student who gives, gives you a hard time or, or you have trouble with a particular landing or a particular area, you don't have anybody to talk to. And believe me, there are people out there who can solve those problems pretty quickly. So you need a mentor. So what you need is a good mentor and you need to build your base hours. And uh, the reason when I say base hours, I mean, you need to get up to around a thousand hours of of time. When you get about a thousand hours of instruction or time in around that, so you've got about a thousand hours in your law book as a CFI, you start acquiring the experience that you need to become effective. And you also know how to run your own show now. Finally, you've done enough, a few of these and or more, and you kind of kind of know how things go. The other thing is you're going to be able to answer the hardest single question you're going to get as a new CFI, which is how many of these have you done? Right? So when you go to a big 141 school, uh, or you, uh, and, and no one asks you that question because they know. And the students who come, they just need to get private, instrument, commercial, commercial, multi, whatever it is, go home uh, or go to, uh, back to China or to wherever, uh, maybe here we have just South America to do, to do your job, right? And so they're not gonna ask you that. But that is a question you're gonna get asked. Now, if you align yourself with a good mentor instructor who you, a senior instructor who's done plenty of these and you say, look, I'm going to uh, have you do stage checks for all of my students. Well, firstly, you've just floated the ego of the instructor, right? You were like, you, all the feathers came up in the plume and were like, ooh, I must be good. Yeah. And then also what's happened is you can also say to the student, I've not done uh, one, I've done some other types of training, but not necessarily this, but I you know, align myself here with Bob. Bob's a mentor instructor here at the school and he does all the stage checks to ensure that the training is done correctly. And then also, of course, that, that instructor will throw you a bone every now and then. Like me, if you come into the school and I had to do a flight review, I'm like, oh, God, I don't want to do a flight review. I hate it. And you were there sitting in the chair and say, hey, you want to do a flight review? You're like, yeah. Right? Or a night flight. You know, those night flights that like they go on to two in the morning. I'm like, no, that's happy hour for me. I'm way past happy hour. That's not good. Right. So I'll say, hey, you want to do the night flight tonight? So that's good to align yourself with that. But if you work for a long large 141 school for a short period of time, you'll gain a lot of time and you'll get mentored because there'll be standards there, right? There'll be a chief pilot, assistant chief, check airman, and there'll be a standardization department. And what you'll get is you'll, a lot of these problems that you see can be corrected, like the landing problems, the, uh, the making sure all your boxes are ticked, and then you can go out on your own right after that, right? Uh, so I, I'll advise you to get about a thousand hours as quickly as you can. Uh, this doesn't mean you have to, but if you can, and you can do that as part of like a structured environment, then you'll get that time quickly. A lot of people like at AeroGuard down in Phoenix are fly about hundred hours a month, maybe more. And so it's, it's not taking forever. Okay. You don't get paid a lot. Wow. That's, it's, that's coming later. This is like, you're paying your dues and you're getting experience and getting all the other benefit from that. And then after you get back from AeroGuard, you can take your uniform and you can throw it in the garbage if you want and Wear, uh, like me, every day, same, same T-shirt. I'm like Mark Zuckerberg uh, with the, with the T-shirt, except for missing several billions, mostly all the billions, I guess, right? Or, or uh, uh, Steve Jobs, Turtleneck, or Melissa Myers, same thing. So that's my uniform. Uh, but uh, you can do with it that what you want. Now, if you, uh, once you've done that sort of thing, uh, one of the real keys is, is to develop a specialty. Develop something that you can do 
right? That's unique because because in marketing, there's called a market differentiation. How are you different than the other person? If all you can say is, you know, I have a, a flight and certificate, I've been doing it like one month more than you. That's not a very big differentiator, right? It's not going to help you sell. So what are you going to do? You're going to acquire credentials. So whatever new credentials you can get, get them. So if you can get an AGI, IGI, this advanced ground instructor, instant ground instructor, uh, you can somehow add a, a gold seal to your instructor certificate, which basically is an advisory circuit that tells you how to do that. But if you have uh, recommended 10 people for a practical test, at least 10 in two years, and eight have passed in the first time, you take that record to the FISDO, and then you'll get a gold seal on your instructor certificate. Uh, now, news on that. Oh, by the way, you also have to have an AGI. So you have to have an advanced ground instructor certificate in order to get that. The good news on that is you can fail everybody else from to the end of time and then never take your gold seal away. <laughs> Right. So there you go. Once you get it, but acquire other credentials, any other credential, maybe it's an advanced avionics training certificate of something, uh, you know, Garmin has their now uh, course on the G1000, whatever those things are, acquire credentials that separate you from the pack, whatever those happen to be. And don't, uh, you'll get this money back later, believe me. Uh, and then finally, I told you aligning yourself with an expensive instructor. I said experience, but also put yourself next to someone who charges a lot because then your rate doesn't look so bad, right? If don't be the guy at the bottom of the barrel because then there's, you know, when people look at things, right? Typically they look, now some people buy only on price and those people get disappointed uh, sometimes pretty quickly. But if you're at the bottom of the barrel, that means that you recognize you're at the bottom of the barrel. And uh, that bottom of the barrel is probably worse what cheapest or less least expensive. Let's, let's put it in those terms, right? Uh, so you want to align yourself with, uh, with this mentor pilot who charges pretty good money for their services, because then you don't, you know, when you're aligned with that person, you can already up your game a little bit right there, just on that relationship you have with, with that person. You also want to do uh, some sort of, excel, you know, the other thing you could do, I'll give you an idea for part 61 people. Well, now, so what we've done so far is we've said, okay, we build our base of time. We've been at a, either a large flight school or a place that turns out a lot of people so we can acquire our time quickly with instructors there who, uh, who can mentor us. If it's a part 61 school, then we've got usually instructors, career instructors there. Or if it's a part 141 school, there's a chief pilot, assistant chief, standards, director standards, those kind, not other instructors. Other instructors have, you know, when they have 100 hours more than you, they think they have a lot of time, right? So, you know, that's not what we're, we don't want those. We want the ones who've been around the horn who have really the amount the experience we want. So then what you can do is you can do accelerated training. So you could, you could like we do, so you could focus on something like that and say, well, my differentiation is not, is not that I can also teach you to be a private pilot, but I can teach you to be a private pilot in a month, or I can do an instant rating in 15 days or 20 days or whatever you, you set the time. And then this will, will uh, acquire people to you that aren't, aren't going to be looking to go to the run of the mill school. Right. And if you do it right in a part 61 school, if you, if you tell the Part 61 school, hey, I'm doing accelerated training here, uh, and you let the front desk people know about that, you let the owner know about that, of course, it's good for their business because they get students, but when someone comes to the door that's looking for that kind of training, you're the only one doing it. It's not, you're not the, the instrument rating dude with 50 other or 20 other people who do an instrument rating. You're the one who does it in 20 days, 15 days, and you get that business, right? So when you differentiate like that, when you're able to do accelerated training or specialty training, and you make that known to the school, then, then you, uh, you're, you're setting yourself up to get business coming your way, right? That, that's what it's doing for you, right? So, um, so accelerated training. Now I'll give you an example of one of the things I used to do, and it was quite simple to do, but think about how this, how this worked. So I, had, uh, I was um, in, the, uh, in the business of being a flight instructor, right? And I had pretty low time. So I had CFI, CFII, and let's say I had around 500 hours of time or something of this nature. And so I worked at a part 61 school and I thought, well, huh, everybody else is, you know, here. Yes, we like each other, we're friends, but we're all looking for the same, same thing. Who's gonna get the next, how we're gonna get the next student, what's gonna happen? And so what I did was once I had a, a several private pilot students, one thing you can say about customers is once you have one, uh, it's the easiest uh, resale you'll ever have, right, is to the customer you already have. So what I would ask each one of them was, are you thinking about doing an instrument rating? And some of them would say no, but a fair number of them would say yes. And I'll say, how would you like to do it in about, uh, 
uh, 20 days. And then, and, and there'll be a cross country trip across the country in it as well. I mean, this is my idea of building base time and cross country time. And they were like, what? And I said, so this is the way it works is uh, you don't need 50 hours of cross country time. This is gonna be all played out in what we do. So we're gonna do 20 hours in the sim and get you instrument proficient in all the basic tasks, holding procedures, instrument approach procedures, that kind of thing. And then as soon as that's done and we're proficient, we're gonna take off from here, from San Jose, California, and we're gonna to go to Key West, which is uh, 25 hours each way in a 172, which is gonna be 50 hours of pure cross country time. We're gonna do that in 10 days or 11 days. And then we're gonna do instant approaches when we get to Phoenix. We're gonna do instant approaches when we get to, you pick the places as you go. And they get life experience, they get actual flight plans, and then they get to Key West, have a good time and come back and they've got the 50 hours of flight time in and they've got another uh, that much instrument time in or nearly that. They've got the time in the sim and it only took about 14 days and then we just do practice for another three or four days and they're ready for the instrument test. And when you think about, they say, well, I can get two weeks off and then you look at where you're gonna stay. And over the period of time, I built up a, a network where I could, uh, I knew where I was gonna stay each time, each day. And so I already knew the instrument approaches. I knew where, how much it was gonna cost to stay various places. And so that was one of the things I made as a product differentiator, right? And that allowed me to build uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours of cross country time, which I needed because I wanted to get ATP later. So I was able to, to structure that and make that work. So then you need to say, well, uh, what do I do about marketing, right? How do I get people, right? Well, that's a whole big subject, but there's marketing that works now and there's marketing that works later. So marketing that works later is word of mouth. And that is what you really want. Because I can tell you for the past, uh, let's say I was, uh, when I was doing flight instruction regularly, I mean, individual all the time flight instructor was picked four years ago. I was the busiest CFI I know, right? And none of those people that I have to spend a dollar to get. They all came from people that knew me through knew me through knew this one died. This guy did this and all really, really uh, good instructors and, and instructors who are busy typically get uh, in, in the old time, they're gonna, in the end game, that's how you're going to get your students. It's from friends of because your network gets bigger, right? And you don't have to do anything. But that's not marketing that works now. That's marketing that works later. But you build up this time, right? You're, you're, that's your end game is to get the word of mouth marketing. Marketing that works now, if you're brand new, nothing works better than sitting in the chair in the flight school. We call it uh, time served, right? So uh, if because the, the thing that the front desk people will do is they will, if you're sitting there and other CFIs are at home, and they have, uh, you know, whatever, wherever they are, they're the, all the front desk people, owners are gonna take the path of least resistance. Whoever's most convenient is, is who they're gonna steer the business to so long as you're reasonable uh, and you're not kind of weird or, you know, that kind of thing. So you sit there and like I can tell new CFIs, I say, if, you, if you're not full, if your place not full, you have a full-time job still. Your full-time job is to sit in that chair, do whatever you need to do until customers come, right? Because they come to the airport. And that's your full-time job. So don't be at home, you know, waiting for people to call you because they won't. So, but however, it, and then the other part of that product differentiation, if you can do something where you're like, like Gary Reeves, what he does is, so he makes about 250 Gs a year. Mm -hmm. And he only flies first class, right? And, uh, uh, and so he, what he does, he travels to customers locations and he does training. There's a three day minimum. It's $1,500 a day is what he charges. And, uh, he does advanced avionics training. So he does Avidyne, he does G1000. He also specializes in four flight and some other things. So he will fly in your airplane with you in your local area, wherever you want to go there and uh, teach you how to fly advanced avionics systems, autopilots and whatever. And that's what he does. He does that all day long. And uh, that's his niche. And so he was able to carve that out. Now you, can you do that right away? Probably not, but, when you, but what's in your way? Experience and base time right? Base experience. How many hours do you have? You know, they get this a lot too. Well, go to a place to give you a lot of hours, right? And they also get good experience. Uh, so your idea here is going to be try to pass 15 hours as quickly as possible, because I'm going to tell you about that magic number. And for us in the old days, it was about a thousand hours, but now it's 15. It's going to tell you whether you answered this question correctly at the top. Are you a teacher or are you a pilot? who needs to be a teacher. It's gonna tell you that. What motivates you as a flight instructor? Uh, this is all gonna come out right about right here. 
Because after you do this for a while, you'll find out that it can be repetitive. There are also a lot to manage. So you have managed schedules, your schedule, student schedule, you have to manage the airplane schedules. Uh, the student uh, will sometimes have a favorite air. Oh, I don't want to fly that one because of the trim, you know, and it's not as good as this one. The seat doesn't do this or the fraud or whatever the reason they give you, right? hundred different reasons. Oh, no, I'm going to cancel. I want to fly that one because I never fly. That one needs more right where I never can get it right. Okay. After a while, I don't care about that. You go like, okay, it needs to be, so maintenance needs to look at it or something, but still you can fly it. Uh, so, uh, but at that point, it'll be apparent to you because the newness of this will have been gone. The, the brand newness is over. And then you're left with the reveal, the big reveal, you know, which is like, like when people get married for the first time, I shouldn't say that. I'm going to say it anyway. But I'm going to say it. Uh, sometimes they misrepresent themselves during the dating process. Oh, that didn't ha never happens, right? Like uh, I'll, I'll do things that they never do just to keep, you know, okay, we'll keep everything going. And then one day you leave the toothpaste cover off and like, what is that? Well, you know, what do you mean? You do that all, what about the coat hangers? They're not lined this way, everything, you know, like, which shit was all that, right? And then you finally, after a while, the truth comes out, right? It's like, well, this is kind of who I am. And so at about 1,500 hours, it becomes who you are. And if this is still for you, you're going to know about it right then, which is another reason to get your base time up very quickly, because you don't want that to take three, four years and go like, oh, that's not for me. You want to know that kind of right away. And, if, and, and also this fringe benefit of being there is you'll have enough time at 1,500 hours. If it isn't for you, you can move on to the what we call the afterlife, which is the regionals or the major, whatever you want, whatever you want to go for, so long as that's good. So uh, that's, a, that's the point you want to get to, because it's around then that you've done enough students and you see there is repetition. So meaning that uh, there's stuff that you're going to do the same over and over again. Not necessarily terrible, like I guess the worst time I had is when I had to train these commercial pilots, I had four of them, and they're all doing the same thing at the same time. So I did, at one day I did uh, 60 or 80 chandelles, <laughs> followed by 60 or 80 steep turns, followed by six, I was like, oh my God, every flight was the same. I like, you know, it's pretty much, as much as I love teaching like this, you know, <laughs> you know <laughs> it's what to blow your brains up, right? You got like, oh my God. Uh, but at this time, you're going to find out if it's for you. And this becomes a very, very important thing because after this point, you know what it looks like. At, at, you probably have a double eye by now, maybe MEI, and maybe you've had some time in some other types of airplanes by this 1500 hour uh, moment. And then you're going to know if it's for you. And it's at that point that we can really drill down and see, are you the first person up here? Uh, what motivates you? Your answers can change. It's okay for them to change, but it still should be on the line. So the answer should be, are you a teacher or are you a pilot who has to be a, a teacher? Either way can work, but the has to be part is the part that you have to ask yourself, is this something I have to do or is it something that, uh, that I want to do, right? The next thing is what motivates you? This answer needs to change from, I can't wait to get up in the morning because I'm going to be able to fly an airplane. That's what motivates you as a and I'm, by the way, I'm going to get paid for it. And someone else is going to get the bill. That's what Gary Reeves calls his crack, your crack code, just like crack cocaine, right? That will change. And what will happen is you will have to get value out of two things. Number one, being an expert in what you do. I mean, not, uh, not a 300 hour expert, not a 500 hour expert. Now you're a 1500 hour expert who has some experience. You've dealt with conflict now within students. You're managing that. You can find these schedule things where every day, everything doesn't bump into everything else. And you're not late all the time. And then what motivates you is maybe it's uh, the fact that you're making a lot of good money now and that uh, your motivation is seeing your students' successes and, and giving them what knowledge and things that you possess and, and sometimes only you possess or only you in a, in a geographical area possesses. Like Gary Reeves gets a lot out of his ability to go train people and stuff he's an absolute expert in, right? In, in the Avidine system. There's probably no, but, no better person to learn the Avidine system from ever, in, anywhere than him. And so when he teaches someone, he knows that. In his heart of hearts, he knows that. And so he's a teacher, right? He's a teacher. He also likes to fly too, don't, don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with that. You, one doesn't come at the exclusion of the other. But uh, when we get to this 1500 hours, you can see it in big 141 schools because most of the students who are there are there to uh, go on to do something else. And, this is, and they're also pretty young, they're around 20 something. 
which is nothing wrong with that either, but, but the attitude changes. So initially that same student, I throw the bone to and say, hey, you can go to the night flight. Be like, um, I already have all the nighttime I need. Uh, I'll do a cross country though. I have to still need, I'll do a cross country for you know, when you go to Montana or something like that. That's cool, right? I'll do that. And then it's like, then you hear them talk about, oh my God, I can't, this, if I have to do one more hour of this, or if I have to fly over that airport one more time, uh, then this is the conversation. So they get kind of jaded at about 1,200, 1,300, because they're getting close to the time. Because every day they go home, it's 1,500 minus whatever they did today, right? That's kind of the, the mantra. And then, uh, and then when they get close to it, then they start being picky. Now, what Wayman does, which kind of interesting, this is the 141 school down here in Miami. Smart guy, uh, Alfredo <clears throat> Wayman, initially what he does is he gives you a bunch of cross-country time all at once. So you're, uh, and it's a good reason for it. He's like, do all the commercial cross countries for the next uh, like three weeks. And so you build a lot of cross country time right away with people who can already fly, right? Commercial pilots, and then do com things that aren't gonna kill you, right? Not doing new students right away. And then what he does is once that's done, you go to primary students. You don't do any more cross country time until the end of your training. Aha, because then you're like, oh, I still need this number of cross country hours and I'm not gonna get them until I have 1300 hours at Wayman. So he does that and that keeps them motivated, right? So that, that's a clever way. Uh, and then the last thing I'll discuss with you is you need to define your ideal customer and uh, how it's how you're going to fill out your schedule. So, uh, and, and also then we'll talk about charging the appropriate amount of money. But what I mean by that is you think about who your ideal customer is, who, it's, who fits with you the best. Is it a person who's going to do advanced avionics, who can fly during the day and not on weekends and not at nights, not in the early morning. Is that, is that your guy or the girl? Who are your ideal customers? And then once you've defined who that is, then you can help market yourself to those people once you've identified that. And again, you let the front desk people know the type of training you do, whatever it is, and, and, uh, and to fit that ideal customer. That way, when that, that ideal customer comes to the door, and hopefully there's plenty of them, uh, you're the guy that fits that uh, or girl that fits that the best, right? So those are some of the ways. And then we'll talk about last thing is you're gonna have to, you think about how much you have to fly. To, uh, so if you're in areas, so let's move down to this little list here. Let's look at hourly rates around the country. 141 schools between 20 and 40 bucks an hour is what they pay. Doesn't sound like a lot, but you're building base time. If you live in the Bay Area, California, uh, the average rates are somewhere between uh, 60 and 120. In Southern California, a little less, about 50 to 100. Dallas, Texas area, 50 to 70. South Florida depends between 40 and 75. Out of the Sun Belt in the middle of the country, 35 to 55. But you need to consider the cost of living and the supply of students. So I can tell you, if you go to the Bay Area, you can start at 70 bucks an hour of San Francisco. And, and within a, two or three months, once you've done a private pilot student, go to 80 something, 80, 85, and even 90. But you know, to live in the Bay Area is going to consume quite a bit of that. So it's not sometimes as good as it looks uh, on that side. Uh, here in South Florida, uh, people told me I was crazy when I came here and I said, we're going to charge exactly the same for CFI training that we charge anywhere else. It's not going to change. South Florida will never support that. The average rate was 40, 50 bucks. Uh, our minimum rate's 85 and our normal rate's 105. And so what happens? Wayman Aviation for advanced training now charges 105 an hour, right? Because it's a specialty. If I'm teaching private pilots, only private pilots at a uh, place that doesn't have a lot of population and I'm charging $120 an hour, I'm not gonna be a flight instructor there very long. So I can't do that there. So, but what I can do is I can do specialty training. I could say CFI training or some other multi, whatever you pick, I can do at a higher rate because not many people do that. Right, so you need to, that, that's the balance of what we're trying to do. If you do uh, specialty training, like uh, advanced avionics training, like Gary and other people, about a hundred you can do for that, especially if, you're, uh, if you fly a lot of different airplane types. Again, that's why you want the base miles. Uh, again, the base time, because it's by time that insurance companies say yes to you flying other things, right? So you wanna fly a Cirrus, you wanna fly a turboprop, you, you're not gonna do that with 300 hours or, or 400, it's not really gonna be happening, right? Maybe serious, but not turboprop. And get insured teaching in it, not gonna be happening. But once you get the base time, this is where it's all at. And then turboprop training between 100 and 200, if I, if I train in turboprop, it's 200, 
right? And if you don't like that, that's great. You can go to SimCom and take time off work. Uh, go uh, stay away from your business for uh, however many days it takes to go do that. And you'll end up spending more anyway. So there you go. So that's what I say. Like, well, whatever, right? So you have to know that. Accelerated training, meaning uh, you decide to do that as a specialty and maybe the normal training rates 40 to 50. You say that's true, but repetition is the key to this business, babe. It is the key to this business. If you can do this repetitively, every day or every whatever we, we tell you to, you know, we, we train, we get CFIs done in, in 10 to 15 hours of flight time. If you, if you come off a recent commercial or you have some experience, uh, if you're not uh, too far out of doing the commercial. And the reason we can, we don't do that an hour per week. If it was an hour per week, we'd probably be 30 hours getting you done, maybe more. We do that every day. Every day we're pushing, pushing the repetition button. That's a law of exercise in the fundamentals of instruction. If you fly tailwheel, it can be a specialty. Uh, uh, and so you could charge a little more for that. And if you also teach an experimental aircraft, maybe because you own one and it's a popular design, you can do more. There are other types of flying that don't pay a lot, right? That, that you think, oh, I'm gonna, I think I'll just do that, this thing. Banner towing. You can go to Bobby's Land here and make $15 an hour towing a banner. Yes, you'll build time and you won't have to teach people to fly, but that's what you're gonna make. Ferrying airplanes, you make almost nothing uh, because almost, X airline guys or airline guys do this because they can travel for free. And so you'll be bidding uh, the time, the airline money to get there or the airline cost to get there and they won't be doing that. Plus if they've crossed the Atlantic seven times uh, in the 747 or the 777, uh, they can get insured to, to do that. You can't. So uh, it's not a very lucrative thing. Skydiving about minimum wage, about 15 bucks an hour if you're doing, uh, doing the jump plane. Low time charter, if, you, if your idea is, I think I'm gonna get on and with this company that uh, as a first officer, you're gonna get paid low, low, low money. And they're never gonna type you. They'll type you when you've got two or 3,000 hours and you've been there forever. So, and you'll get paid 20 to 40 bucks an hour for that. This idea of island hopping, you know, little things, little, from one island to the next pays about 20 bucks an hour. Regional carrier, you're gonna make about 20 bucks an hour over averaged over a year. It's about 40,000 a year, 40 to 50,000 a year in your first year. And that's, Kind of, well, maybe 40. And then if you upgrade the captain, it'll go double that. So you'll make about 70, 60, 80 in this region. And then when you go to your first uh, airline job, it'll be 50 bucks an hour as a first officer. But now your time in, you've got flight instructor, which took you uh, however long to get. Then you had a year and a half, two years to build your base time. And then you had to be a first officer for three years. Uh, and then you've got about 4,000 hours. And then, then you can finally uh, do that for a couple of years and then jump into here. And then finally you get the, the money comes really when you upgrade the captain. So that's uh, what that is. So the idea here is be in a place that there's an abundance of students and be willing to move if you have to, even if it's temporary. I've had people who leave, who, have, who are married, have a house, have all this stuff and say, I need to do this thing. And uh, say, I just need to do it uh, until this time comes and make a date. This is the entry date, the exit date, whatever that is, make the weekends, whatever in between some things work and go get your base time. This is the key to getting it all done. And then price-wise, don't be the cheapest guy. This, uh, and it, depending on, so move into a place where the cost of living is reasonable. Like here, the cost of living is very reasonable. And if you're doing something and you've got your base time built, like the guy was telling you, well, well I didn't tell you. So as a guy, guy who works at Gold Standard, which is a serious training facility, and he's a flight instructor, and he's uh, about three years as a CFI. Now he only flies Cirruses. What do they charge per hour? What does the, the Wayman and other places charge? 40. What does he get now? 80, 85, right? Uh, he's specialized, but he couldn't get that until he had the base miles. So get your base miles. All right. So hopefully that'll do it. Now, so it, when I started uh, doing this, uh, it wasn't, so I, I was a chief pilot of a 141 school. And so everybody else was making 30 bucks an hour. And I said, I'm going to, because chief pilot, I'm going to make myself 60, but I'm chief pilot, the product differentiator, right? And I've never charged less than that. So currently, uh, with the exception of people I kind of know or people have been, I charge between 105 and 145. And if I, that's for general instruction. And if I do uh, training uh, at the other end, uh, like turboprop or whatever, it's 200. And people say, well, uh, so because I want to be the emergency flight instructor. So I want to charge like maybe I'm, I'm thinking about, it, I'll think I'll charge 300 bucks an hour. Then it, but then no one will use me much. But then when they go, oh, you're the only one left in the room, I say, there you go, right? <laughs> and if you have enough of those people, you can make a business out of that. And oh, by the way, if you're busy, keep raising your rate until you're not busy. 
right? Keep raising your rate until you reach that threshold. You can always change it back, right? But uh, otherwise, just leave the money on the table. So just keep increasing it until people say no, or you think they're going to say no. I went from 80 to 100 and didn't see any loss of business. I went from 100 to 120. It's all minor loss of business, right? And 120 to 140, I got a new set of customers, right? They're all different. They were highly motivated and they had enough money to be able to pay for it and they wanted to finish it. And I, I didn't have any of these people who were scrounging around for change in their uh, to pay for a flight hour, you know, the, which is nothing wrong with that either. But that not, that's not my ideal. When I define my ideal customer, it wasn't that. And there has to be enough of those, right? There also has to be enough of them. Huh. So let's look at a few more things here. Uh, so next week in the power hour, I sort of want to go through this with you because there are going to be some really good ones coming up. Uh, yeah. The best liability insurance, by the way, to protect yourself. Uh, it's with SAFE, uh, S-A-F-E. They have a liability policy. They work with an insurance company through Society of Aviation Flight Educators. Uh, and uh, that's what I would use for that. What's the average cost instructor insurance? Uh, it's about $1,100 a year uh, for liability insurance. If you want time, uh, if you want to have uh, insurance just to cover your rental aircraft, you're, you're looking at about $300 a year. Um, let's see. Uh, okay, and let me go through. So look, some of the new power, the power hours coming up, a uh, tailwheel fun, this is going to be a fun time. If, even if you don't want to fly a tailwheel plane, there's some aerodynamics in here, right? Which will be fun for you to understand about tailwheel airplanes, what makes them different and why actually we, we don't make a tailwheel airplane that in commercial use, uh, business use, or in, just for fun now. Uh, how do, uh, and the next one is on February 6th, how to take pilots from other categories and classes into airplane single engine land. That seems to be a big trouble in our CFI classes is how do you take someone who has a rotorcraft helicopter and the training requirements for uh, airplane single end land. So what has to be trained, what endorsements have to be given and what is gonna be on the practical test. And surprise, that student cannot be a student pilot. So the student pilot regulations will never apply. So you can't solo someone under those regulations. It's a whole different thing. So we'll look at that as well. Uh, we also have uh, previous power hours coming out that we have for wings credit. Those are gonna start, I think next week because we've now got the bandwidth for it. So if you will, you'll get a message on that, it'll be an hour uh, before this one and you'll get wings credit for that. So if you need wings credit, you'll, you'll get that. Uh, we also, our membership sites open, which you probably know about. It's a basic advanced and pro and uh, it's, a, it's a really cool site. It looks like this. I'll just show you what it kind of looks like and why you'd want it would be, it keeps you updated on all of our stuff, right? Those focus training resources, it's our individual guides to like passing tests and airman etiquette. Uh, we did a series of podcasts, about 16 podcasts last year. They're there. Also is a complete private pilot ground school. So if you know people who are want to be private pilots or you uh, are CFI and you want to be able to use that with your students, you can. We also give you two to three short subject videos, uh, like and one of the antennas on the airplane was one of them. Uh, a lot of short stuff. And then we also have our Jekyll Island tribal knowledge videos, deep dives in the content. And then all these power hours, all 27 of them are in there for you to download. And you can like listen to them as podcasts or you can uh, watch them. And then we're finally getting the stories coming. The stories are cool because in the CFI class, I have a lot of stories that are, relate to the content. And so we're stripping all those out and putting those in there. Some of them are pretty funny, right? And we have community here. So we have that as well. The classes, if you're interested in the class, and then we'll come back to the content in a second. Uh, we have initial class starting February 1st to the 7th. And uh, for those of you who are attending in Palo Alto, it looks like we're not going to be able to do it in Palo Alto. Uh, it looks like we're only going to be able to uh, uh, to be able to do it in Miami and or and live streaming because of the restrictions. And then on the 15th of March, we have another initial class that we hope, well, that'll be at Opalaca and then April will be in Palo Alto. And then you can see the instrument uh, ones there. You'll get this by the by the, uh, by the email and you, there are clickable links in here so you can see all of that. So that's what we have coming up. And the membership site is really cool. Really finally got that going and happy to, happy to have that. So uh, that's what we've got. And I hope that, uh, I hope what's happened is we got you uh, spun up to think about answer, asking those questions that we said at the very beginning, which is, uh, are you a teacher or, or are you a pilot needs to be a teacher? What motivates you? and know that you got to build up that base time. And once you've built up the base time, uh, then all of a sudden, all this stuff starts becoming available to you. All these, 
uh, opportunities will become available to you and different airplane types, different types of insurance uh, will be available to you. Like you can get your, your insurance will, will the, for a TBM or for other things will, will be, they'll say, start saying yes and not no all the time. And I think that's, uh, in the beginning, they say no a lot. So that's what we've got. And uh, I guess we're just about that point uh, where we got to say bye. It's uh, five minutes to the hour. So great deal. Nice to see y'all. And let's see if we can get over 100, 120 next week. Tell all your friends. Up then. See ya from Miami. Welcome to Miami. I heard the brainstorms ain't nothing to mess with, but I can't feel a grip on the strip.